And uh, I, I love being a believer right now because we are living history. I mean, you can wake up every day and say, wow, we are right in the middle of God uh, uh, having history unfold in our eyes. And, you know, I like to win. I like triumph. And we've been studying the book of Nehemiah, which is a picture of how God can bring triumph in any circumstance. You know, I'm glad when I mess up, God is big enough when I say, Lord, I'm so sorry I messed up. God can actually turn my life around so my life is a life of triumph. He can do that for you and me. He can do that for families. And God is not constrained. He, he can even do it for a country of mil, hundreds of millions of people. I am so grateful that God is a triumph, a transcendent God who can make, no matter what kind of mess we, we might make, God is bigger if we will repent and turn to Him. If my people will humble themselves. How many, how many of y'all are in that group? How many of how many of us are Second Chronicles seven fourteen people said, Lord, count me in. I will humble myself and pray. I'll pray that the Lord set, set me free from my personal stuff, and God will hear from heaven, and he will set us free. Well, we're going to continue, and Lord will, and we're going to finish up our series on Nehemiah today because it's a picture of triumph. It's so exciting to read. You know, I like to read books where the, the ending is like, victory and triumph and that's what this book is all about one of the things i love about the, the triumph that comes in the book of nehemiah is the mess that they were in how did it happen it was their own mess ups now isn't that amazing god can even take the mess ups that somebody does and he can turn them into triumph and we've been studying that uh, uh the last few weeks let me just go back on a few things here obviously is a picture uh symbolically of building the wall uh, in Jerusalem in the Nehemiah's day and we've we've looked at how we can go to first chronicle first Corinthians 10 and other places and say these verses give us a template of how we can learn from these things how it's good to learn from other people right it, and as we have all these lessons through through history that uh, Jewish the Jewish nation walked through the wilderness long ago and everything they went through did what serves as lessons that teach us it makes me want to say, Lord, I am teachable. We are teachable. We want to learn from what they've been through. It says lessons that can teach us, and the object is that is so that we can learn. Can we say that phrase together? Lord, we can learn, and we will learn, and we will learn. We are people who discern the days that we're in, and God, teach us how to be your people for such a time as right now. And so the other... Uh, verse that we've been looking at is that just shows how we can look back on the history and realize God has great things in store for us. The story of Israel is a lesson in God's ways. How many of us want to learn about God's ways? What the Lord has directed Israel through is one way that we can learn what God's ways are. And we've heard true stories. You know, when we, you know, when I first got saved, I was in a denominational church and I was so excited to be born again. And I, I, I went to this pastor. And I asked him, he says, Lord, what's, what's a book that you can, you can tell me about how I can learn about the Bible? And his response is, well, it's a good book, but it's kind of fairy tales. I said, you know what, I need to find a new church. Now that I'm a baby believer, I'm ready to find a new church because God's, what we learn about Israel are true stories. These are things that have happened to people just like us. Now God triumphed through them to bring out his destiny for Israel. And he's still doing that today. I'm glad as American believers... We can say we have a rich heritage about the great marvels of our God. Is that true? We have a rich heritage about what God has done in this nation. Through men and women just like us who said, God, let's do it your way. Teach us how to be a people that resemble who you are and what you like. We're told in Ephesians 5, I believe, to find out what pleases the Lord. We have another opportunity right now to say we want to know what pleases you so we can be salt and light. For a situation right now where we are in a mess but we believe that even though we're in a mess that you are a god of triumph and you will lead us through it and you've even given us a template of how to do that in the book of nehemiah and other places and i love this we can we can look at the true marvels of our god and how his miracles and power have brought us thus far i'm glad that god is a miracle working god I'm glad that he was a miracle working God, a God of power. He is and he will be. That's who he is. 
I believe that we will see God's power move in our day in more powerful ways than we've seen thus far. I'm grateful for every miracle that we've seen in the body of Christ, and I believe God has much more, and He's looking for people who will humble ourselves before Him and to say, here we are, Lord, use us. And His miracles and power have brought us all this far. Now again, let me just underscore, what does that imply? God's not through with us yet. He wants to move us forward. How many of us want to move forward with what God is doing in our day? God, move us forward together. Now, this is just going back a few weeks. Here's a template of things that God wants us to do from. He wants us to be people of perspective and prayer and getting his plan, all these other things. And we won't, uh, uh, it's just a, a quick reminder about how there's a temple of all the things that God wants us to do to be a pe- people that he can use to advance his cause that he would be glorified. And we have the opportunity to protect what God is doing because if you have a vision from God, it's 100% guaranteed what's going to happen sooner or later. It's going to be attacked. Does God have a plan for that? Absolutely. And that's what we've been talking about, and I want to uh, share some more thoughts about that today. But here's just uh, going back again. This is a quick review. The attacks of the enemy are persistent. They They started before. They happened during the the building of the wall, and even after the wall was built, the enemy was still attacking. Hello? Some things never change. There's nothing new under the sun, right? There may be some things happening in this country that I never thought this would happen here, but the Lord says there's nothing new under the sun, so we may tend to be a little bit dismayed. Wow, how could this be happening? This is the United States of America. Stuff like this doesn't happen here. You know what the Lord says? I've seen it all. I had an answer for them then, and I've got an answer for you now because there's nothing new under the sun. We are reminded of God's promise. And the enemy used various tactics. We've looked at some of those. And what the outcome was that Nehemiah had strategic insight from the Lord and his, those around him, and they had the appropriate response for every attack that came. And how many of the attacks of the enemy stopped the wall? None. And the wall got built so nothing that the enemy tried to bring against Nehemiah and the people of Jerusalem worked. I believe that's a template for us today. If we humble ourselves before the Lord today, He will give us strategic strategy from heaven about what to, what to do with every circumstance that the enemy might throw at us. It is good. I mean, we win. I've read the, we've all read the back of the books. You know, like, I forget what his name was years ago. I believe from the table of contents through the maps, it's God's victory. It's a picture of God's victory, and there's some very practical, strategic principles that are in the book of Nehemiah, and we're going to take a next step with that. By the way, God wins, and we're changed for the better in the process. There's nothing new under the sun. And what we talked about is there's, you know, it's not the only thing in the, in the book of, uh, uh, in the Bible by any means because we're more absorbed in serving Jesus and worshiping Him and honoring Him than dealing with the enemy. Is that right? Yeah. But when He comes, we want to be able to strategically stand in the name of the Lord and triumph because that's what God, we're, we're told to be strong in the Lord and the power of His might that we can overcome every attack of the enemy. Now, just as a reminder, we know that we, here, here's one verse that tells us that God wants to show us about how to triumph in spiritual warfare. We are not ignorant of his devices. And this is a, a picture of, of knowing what Satan's strategies are so we can triumph over them. And we, we've talked about how he comes against God's people in two primarily, pri, primary ways. One is he comes at us directly, says, I am out to stop you. I am out to thwart everything that God is doing. I'm putting on my black hat, and I, I'm telling you, I'm, and we know that that's one way that the adversary can come against you and against God's people. For your enemy, the devil walks about as a roaring island. There's no subtlety. You know, this is like, like we've talked about in the Lone Ranger where we had the guys in the white hats who were the good guys and the guys in the black hats. I don't know if y'all had something similar in South Africa, but that was just a, a stereotype of growing up as a kid. There was always, you know, the, white, the Lone Ranger was the good guy, and he always had a white hat, and we knew where the guys with the, bad, with the black hat showed up. Here comes trouble. 
And that's one of the ways that Satan comes against us is just overtly. By the way, the first two that we looked at were he came against them with, with scorn and you know didn't fire a shot or anything. I believe that if the enemy would come against us with his scorn and his attacks, I think he would love it if we would just capitulate and he's going to have the whole thing we don't even fight. That's not what we do, right? We stand in the name of the Lord. So what he did the next time, he says, I'm going to come and I'm, we're going to kill you. We're going to gather up arms. And that was also unsuccessful, right? Why was it unsuccessful? They found out that no, Tobiah and Sanballat and all of them were going to come against them to try to come against them with force. Did that happen? No. There wasn't a shot fired, so to speak. And what, what was the strategy of Nehemiah and his group? They took up arms to defend themselves. I'm glad that Nehemiah and his group passed the Second Amendment back there in, in Jerusalem. The, a, the, ap, you know, the, ac, the applicability, to make up a word, to where we are right now is very clear. I believe we have a biblical responsibility and obligation and an uh, opportunity to defend ourselves, and that's, that's incorporated in our Constitution as the Second Amendment. So they chose to defend themselves, and a shot was never fired. The strategy worked. Would you agree with me? So these are the first three, just reviewing. Here's the first three attacks that they did that came against Nehemiah and the people in Jerusalem directly. None of these three worked. So what are the, this, this enemy tried to do something completely different. And when he turned, he did, by the way, and here's completely different, brings us to this strategy. 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen 14 says, Satan himself also transforms himself as what? An angel of light. In this case, what does he try to do? He tries to look like a good guy. And that's what we see from the, this, the last four attempts of the enemy to thwart what God was doing in, in Jerusalem. By the way, here is, we do need to pray about our situation. Here is a picture of the 69th day of violence in Portland, Oregon. We need to pray. I mean, this is a strategy of trying to bring physical violence that uh, we really have not seen in our, or I've seen very, very little in our history. Can we pray right now? Father, we just come in the name of Jesus, the mighty, powerful name of Jesus. We pray that there be no loss of life, no bloodshed on either side of the equation. But God, we stand in the powerful, mighty name of Jesus, and we say we, we stand to stop all violence. Father, we pray for the situation that's happen, happening in Portland, that's happened in, in Seattle. And Father, we just pray, stop that in the name of Jesus. We bind all powers of anarchy and destruction in the name of Jesus. And God, we pray that you would give skilled strategy about how to quell this without the loss of life. But God, we pray that it be stopped in the name of Jesus. And we pray that whatever is needed to bring an end to this sort of violence would stop in Jesus' name. You know, we were praying last night with uh, Darwin and Vicky, Vicky on a beautiful hill overlooking downtown Weatherford because there was a chance of having a situation like this in Weatherford, Texas last night. I hope that nothing, nothing happened, but we were out there praying. We wanted to be there to pray that we don't want to see this we don't want to see it in Seattle or Portland or Weatherford, Texas or any place else. But again, the pattern here is God brings strategic strategies to overcome every attack of the enemy. So, we, we, so those are the first three where Satan is overtly saying, I'm out to stop what God is doing. The next four tactics are subtle where the, the enemy is relying on misinformation and infiltration and deception and traps. He changes the strategy to say, hey, I'm just like you. Let's, let's be buddies. Now, we looked briefly last time at uh, uh, Nehemiah chapter 6 where uh, Tobiah and Sanballat and now the rest of the enemies, the group of the, the list of enemies was growing. They said, come out and meet together with us. And we looked at how in Hebrew this meet together means to fix upon by agreement. It, there's an implication here that this word Meat is even used sometimes in marriage, like a close union, a, a, an alliance. And uh, the word together means 
to form a unit, to be united. So what the enemy was doing here is saying, I'm taking off my black hat, I'm putting on a fake pseudo white hat, and let's be buddies. Let's be friends. There's not that much difference between us and you. Let's be buddies. Come out and let's meet together. You know what? We don't want to meet together with the enemy if he comes to try to lure us away. It's a good thing to say, I'm going to continue to do what God has told me to do. Amen? So, so that, is, uh, that is what we see. Come, come let us meet together. That was, that was what the, the challenge was. And uh, Nehemiah realized they were plotting to harm, and he sent messages saying, I am doing a great work. I cannot come down. Why should I leave what God is telling me to do? And that should be what we do too. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep doing what God has told me to do. So now we know that uh, Sam Ballot wasn't, he was persistent. He sent the same letter not, not once but five times to try to undermine what uh, to, uh, Nehemiah was doing and try to get him to stop. And we took a look that he brings this open letter and it says five times it was reported. They were reporting. And we looked at how in Hebrew this word report means to publish. So they were publishing among the nations three things that you and the Jews are planning to revolt. Was that true? No. It says that according to these reports, you, Nehemiah, be made king. Was that true? No. You know, Nehemiah had no intent. He was, if you read the book of Nehemiah, he was very respectful to the authority of the king. He never usurped, usurped his authority as a leader in, in Nehemiah. He said, I didn't even take the allotment that was giving to, given to me of goods because I knew we were in financially in a difficult place, so I didn't even take what was due to me. He was not after any more authority or power. Now, we've talked about how these Tobiah and Sanballat were fixed on how you want to be made king, and we talked about how sometimes the enemy accuses us of what? what they want for themselves. <laughs> and so this, uh, th according to these reports, you were to be made their, you want to be made their king. And again, that was not true. And it's reported that you're going to make a proclamation saying you're going to be made king. Now, none of these things were true, right? And Nehemiah had the wisdom to say there is no, he replied, there is no truth in any part of this story. You're making up the whole thing. Now, I love the result of this. They were trying to intimidate us, imagining that they could discourage us and stop the work. But what happened? So I continued the work with even greater determination. I believe that every attack that the enemy would bring to us can work for good that makes us stronger to do what God has called us to. And why should we listen to a voice that's trying to undermine God's words, God's work? We want to listen to Him and what He's telling us to do. Amen? So that was the, the first subtle attack. You know, we could have described that as fake news. Does anybody, is fake news, a, and I had mentioned that when I first heard this expression a few years ago, I thought, well, I was just kind of talking about sometimes People might exaggerate a little bit, and you go, wow, there's more to this. We're certainly not saying that every news outlet is corrupt, but this is a problem that we are facing, and it's straight out of the book, and when it happened against Nehemiah, who won? God's work. God's people won. Let me just add one other P.S. about that, two things about that, and I think it certainly brings up the question to us, whose report are we listening to? You want to listen to what God is saying. There's many, I believe, credible prophetic voices that are saying, as much as the, all their smoke is of the challenges that we're facing, God is up to great things, and we will see that break forth in our day. I choose to replete, believe the report of the Lord. I believe we could be in an era we see a massive outbreak of what, what God is doing to bring revival and healings and hundreds of thousands of people brought in the kingdom of God. And that's the template of this book. God is a God of triumph and overcoming every attack of the enemy. 
That's what uh, 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 Luke eleven nineteen. I'm paraphrasing here. It says God has given us power to triumph over some of the attacks of the enemy. Is that what it says? What does it say? Overall, okay, and this is a book which shows us how to overcome every, they overcame every attack that came against them. By the way, let me just read this too about this whole thing about media. And it says, and I'm not, I, I don't have the reference here, but the point is most of the people who are making most of the noise and make the news are less than 1% of the population. Now that's an abuse of the media, don't you think? You know? And one of the biggest problems with this issue with the press is not just making up stuff and making that be the news, but it's not telling us the things we do need to know that are happening. And censorship, right? And we're not hearing many things about the good things that God is doing. So that's the, that's the other side of this. Well, let's take a look at... Uh, would we like to see three more attempts of the enemy to undermine the work of God and to see him fail three more times? That's where we're headed this morning. And we're going to turn to uh, Nehemiah chapter, chapter 6. This is a subtle, deceitful attack. And so this person, Shemaiah, comes to uh, Nehemiah and says, Let us meet together in the house of God within the temple. And let us close the doors of the temple, for they're coming to kill you. And indeed at night they will come to kill you. Now, was this a good idea for Nehemiah to do? To come in the temple, why is that? Scripturally, who could go into the temple? I mean, was, was Nehemiah a priest? No. So this is an attempt to do what? For people to, to inside people to set a spiritual trap. I think that one of the things that our adversary loves to do the most is set a trap that we step into it ourselves. You know, take, take a look at the first situation in the garden. How did, how, what, was, what was the enemy's tactic, tactic to undermine what God was doing in the Garden of Eden? Was it attack them overtly? Did he put on his black hat? No, he was to try to trick them into doing something that God didn't want them to do. Well, this is, there's nothing new under the sun, right? So here is the attempt as an inside person to try to get Nehemiah to do something that was unscriptural. So, you know, when Uzziah the king did this in 2 Chronicles 26, he broke out with leprosy because that was, that was not something that anybody but a priest should do. But here is an insider who is coming again saying, let's meet together. Let's make a union. Let's unite together. And... Uh, let us meet together in the house of God within the temple because they're coming to kill you. Okay? What does Nehemiah do? He says, and I said, should a man, here's his response. Should a man such as I flee? And who is there such as I who would go into the temple to save his life? I will not go in. You know, when the enemy comes against us and tells us to do something that we shouldn't do, you know what our response should be? Just real simple. I'm, I'm not going in. I'm not doing that. I'm going to do what God has told me to do. And thank God he knew just from knowing Scripture that this was just wrong, and he was also able to perceive. Thank God for discernment. Sometimes our heart just tells you, there's just something fishy about this. Now, I believe that discernment should be not just against things that aren't right. I believe that we should have discernment. We walk into a place, wow, there's just the peace of God's in this place. The love of God is in this place. But thank God for the discernment. How many of us have been in situations, there's something about this that doesn't feel right? Well, that's what Nehemiah had working for him, in addition to the fact that he knew he was not going to violate Scripture by going into the temple. He says, I perceive that God had not sent him at all but that he pronounced this prophecy against me. You know, the first time we see this come together, it was when Tobiah and Sanballat said, come out and let's meet together. You know, we want the church to be out there in society, outside the walls of church. But we want to do it scripturally, right? Now here's an attack that says, come in, let's meet together inside the walls of church. You know, the enemy would try to mess things up in church, and we say, no, we're going to do it God's way here in the house of God. 
Now, Nehemiah goes on to say, For this reason he was hired that I should be afraid and act that way in sin, so they might have a cause and evil report that they might reproach me. But my God, they say my God. We have our God, my personal God. You can say my God was with me in the middle of this challenge. And I knew what to do because he showed, I had a knowledge of Scripture and also perceived. My, my heart said, this is just not right. I can't do that. And so because of these two reasons, Nehemiah was able to say, I'm not going into the temple. But again, this was a subtle, deceitful attempt to bring warfare against Nehemiah. Did it work? No. My God, remember Tobiah and Sanballat according to their works. Remember them. So this first, this is the, the, first, the first subtle attack was come out, let's meet against the, uh, on the, Let's meet together on the plains of Ono. It didn't work. Let's meet together. Let's be buddies. Here's the second one. It says, come into the temple. And he was trying to, uh, an inside person was trying to uh, set a spiritual trap, but this inside person was a secret informer. And he says, no, I'm not going there. So this was a subtle attempt for somebody inside uh, inside Jerusalem to try to trick uh, Nehemiah and doing the wrong thing. But there's more. Now here's the context. We're, we're looking right at the end of the wall. It says, just 52 days after we had begun, the wall was finished. When our enemies heard about this, they were frightened and humiliated. Now I love that. Because from the beginning, the enemies were trying to frighten and humiliate Israel, but who ends up being frightened and humiliated at the end? They were, and I, that's our story too. I believe that we can be, in our day, we can be just like Fanny, uh, Fanny Crosby and her familiar hymn. This is my story. This is our story because God was with us and He is giving us courage and triumph and wisdom to overcome every strategy of the enemy. I know I've said this before, I'm, I'm thrilled to be a believer in this day, right where we are in this country, because I believe God is going to thwart every attack against, against His church, whether it's in South Africa or Korea or United States or wherever it is. And I, I love the other outcome of this. It says, uh, after 52 days, our enemies were frightened and humiliated because they realized something. What do they realize? The work had been done with the help of our God. I play at, as, a, as a result of what we'll see in our nation in the weeks and months and years ahead that there will be hundreds of thousands and millions of people say, you know what, I was not a believer. But there's something about what I've seen happen in my day. Would you tell me about your Jesus? And what do we need to be able to do then? Share that I'd love to tell you about him. I'd love to tell you, and I pray that there be millions of people who are detractors right now. I, I heard a, 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 an actor, I'm going to try to paraphrase something he said, that uh, he came out of the Hollywood scene. He was a, a very well-known actor on American television in the 70s, became a believer, and he says, you know what, if we can't remember what it was like when we were a non-believer and we thought Christians were crazy, we're a little bit too far away, we're too much in our bubble. <laughs> You know, we need to be accessible to people who say, you know, I thought you Christians were nuts. We need to be the ones who says, we, let, us, let me tell you about our God. When they realize that the, what has happened in this nation is done with the help of our God, let us be the first ones to say, I'd love to tell you about that. So, which brings us to the, the next subtle attack where inside the gates, the enemy is trying to thwart what, Nehemiah was doing. And this is just laughable. Let's just read this and listen to this for a second. During those 52 days, many letters went back and forth between who? Tobiah and who? The nobles of Judah. And you're going, what is this about? Now, what are the 52 days we're talking about here? This is during the construction of the wall in Jerusalem, right? And it says, during these 52 days, it didn't say one letter, one post, one telegram. What does it say? Many letters were going back and forth between Tobiah and, did I read this right? The nobles of Judah. You're going, what is this about? 
For many in Judah had sworn allegiance to him because his father-in-law was Shechaniah, son of Era, and his son Jehohanan was married to the daughter of Meshullam, the son of Berechiah. You know, if nothing else, here's a quick, uh, here's a quick uh, encouragement. to Marry the right person. <laughs> you know, have your friends. You know, th- there's a verse, I believe it's, I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, I believe it's out of Psalm 101 or Psalm uh, 103. It says, I will be a companion to those who fear thee. We, whether we're talking about marriage or just friendship, we want to be allied with people who love God. And that's not what's going on here. If we ally ourselves, bad company does what? Corrupts good morals. I mean, that's paraphrasing a scriptural truth. It will cause us to not see things straight and be allied with people we shouldn't be allied with. And that's what happened here. That's the reason why there are these many letters going back and forth between Tobiah and the, Ju- the nobles of Judah. You know, if I got a letter, if we got a letter from Tobiah, what do you think we ought to do with it? Re- re- burn it and say, return to sender. I don't want to know what you said. You're the one who was giving all these false reports and all these lies. Why? I'm not even going to open this letter. But it says it sent many letters back. Now, there's something just absolutely laughable here about the enemy. And you know what? God doesn't look at the, at the attacks of the enemy and go, <gasps> what does he do? Psalm 3. He looks down and what does he do? He laughs. You've got to be kidding me. You know, when we were praying up on the, on the hill last, uh, on, overlooking Weatherford last night, as we were praying peace over Weatherford, Darwin said something I felt like it was very, very true. He said, we, we, we tend to over-exaggerate how smart we think the devil is. You know, I got to thinking of the Wile E. Coyote and the, and the Roadrunner uh, cartoons. I don't know if you all had those in, in South Africa. But that, I understand that that was created by a Christian. Hanna-Barbera, who realized this is a picture we have an enemy that comes against us time after time. And the, you know, the wily e. Coyote is like, this time I've got him for good. I've got this big anvil, and I'm going to lure him to the edge of the cliff, and we're going to get him. I've got this pack. I don't know where the Acme Company built everything. I mean, there's always the Acme Company in these. But he's got this box of Acme Dynamite, and I'm going to get this wrapped around the, uh, the, the coyote, or around the, the uh, uh the Roadrunner, and this time I forget. This time it's really going to work. Well, what happens every single time? <laughs> That's right. That's right. Beep beep happens every time. Either you see the coyote blown up, or you see him what going over the very cliff that he had designed for the Roadrunner to go over. That is a summary, a theological summary of the book of Nehemiah. They won every single time. And what we're looking at here is the sixth attack, where there's these letters. And just like this Roadrunner and Wile E. Coyote situation, this is laughable what the enemy was doing. It says he sent many letters to these nobles in Judah who never should have made alliance with Tobiah in the first place. And there's, as we just alluded to briefly, whether it's friendships or marriages or whatever, we want to be able to join with the right people. But let's take a look at the, we find out something about the contents of these letters. He says, these letters were kept telling me about Tobiah's good deeds. That's the content of these letters. Tobiah is sending letters to these, these, Jew, these uh, nobles in Judah saying, Tobiah is really a great guy. Sound like these nobles had met together. They had made an alliance. They had united with Tobiah, which is a huge mistake. So the first thing he said, this is really a joke. They kept telling me about, so these, look at the, 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 the nobles are coming to Tobiah and saying, hey, Tobiah is really a great guy. You know, this, these are what these letters were about. And But that's the first thing we find out about these letters is, is trying to convince, is, is convincing these elders, uh, these nobles, that they was, uh, what a good guy Tobiah was. It was, of course, completely false. Here's the second thing we found about these letters. And they told him, now who's the him there? Tobiah. 
They told him everything I said. Now, what do we call that? Being a, a spy, <laughs> you know, or worse. Now, just think of this. They're writing, Tobiah's writing letters to these nobles saying, man, I'm really a great guy, and they're buying it. And the nobles are writing letters back to uh, Tobiah. And what is the content of the letters back to Tobiah? Nehemiah is doing this, and here's his plan to do is this, and his plan. Think, what is going on with these people? But again, this, this is another picture of another subtle, indirect, deceitful attack that the enemy, and didn't work. This is tactic number six. The first five didn't work, and here's the sixth one. Did it work? No. Now, here's, the third, here's, the, here's another thing about these letters, which is just, again, laughable. You know, as beep beep, as funny as seeing the road runner win every time, is, you know, Tobiah knows that there's these letters that are trying to convince, you know, these nobles are coming to Tobiah or to uh, Nehemiah saying, hey, Tobiah's not such a bad guy. Well, there's some other letters that Tobiah was writing directly to Nehemiah. You know what these said? And Tobiah kept sending threatening letters to me <laughs> to intimidate me. Now, can you imagine the irony of the, here's these nobles coming to Tobiah and said, are coming to Nehemiah saying, hey, look at these letters. Man, Tobiah is really a great guy. And Nehemiah is getting direct letters directly to him. And what, what are these letters that Tobiah is sending directly to Nehemiah saying? <laughs> threatening him. <laughs> Do you, think, do you think that Nehemiah is deceived for a minute about these letters? But again, my point is, here's the sixth attempt that the enemy tried to do to thwart the wall, and it didn't work. But here's another one that's subtle. And we're going to go to the seventh one and the final one. Now, this is in Nehemiah 13. And this is after the wall is built, okay? Okay. The first six did not stop or thwart the wall being built. As a matter of fact, it energized us that their attacks, whether it was overt or whether it was subtle and deceitful, it said, we continued the work with even greater tenacity and greater strength, and they were the ones who were humiliated and realized, look what God has done. That's a picture. Of, I believe that's a prophetic picture of what we'll see as a body of Christ if we will continue to just humble ourselves and seek His face in this day. And I believe that there's millions of American believers who are doing that. Millions of people in the body of Christ across the world who will see God move. And for every single, no matter what kind of tactic the enemy pulled, it did not work. And God won. And here's the, the seventh and final attack that we see. That there's this person named Eliashab. And what's his role? We're told what, what his job description was. He's a priest who had been appointed as a supervisor. And this, by the way, the wall is up at this point. We have a persistent enemy. Even though the work gets done, he doesn't give up. Eliashab, the priest who had been appointed as supervisor of the storerooms of the temple of our God. Now, is what's stored in the storerooms of the temple of God, is that important? What's stored, what's kept for use in the temple of God, that is important stuff. You know, I mean, we all have, you know, we might have our... You know, our storage unit we bought somewhere, we put the stuff that maybe we don't use for two years. But inside the temple of God, it's important what's stored there. It says, uh, Eliashab, who is uh, appointed of the supervisor of the storerooms, making sure what the right things were in these storerooms was his job. And he was also a relative of, this guy keeps showing up. He was a relative of Tobiah. And he, Eliashab did what? He converted a storeroom in the temple and gave it to who? His relative. He gave it to Tobiah. Now this again is a subtle, you know, these attacks we're taking a look at today are trying to co-opt the people and the assets that are inside what God is doing and trying to undermine what God is doing from the inside out. 
does that have any applicability to what we're looking at today? I would say, yes, it does. And I believe God will triumph in our day just the way he did then. And that's why this is in this book. So we can take encouragement and we can have complete confidence that God will move in our day just the way he always has. Because he's the God who was, who is, and is to come. I believe God can take all fear off of us as individuals, as the body of Christ, and empower us to be his people, to stand in this day and to pray and do what we can in our small, whatever our sphere of influence is. And as we join together with dozens and hundreds and thousands and millions of believers, we will see a move of God in our day. And this is a triumph, triumphant template of that. But here is, a, anyway, so this guy is a, is a relative of Tobiah and gave Tobiah a large, not just a closet, but a large storage room and place it at whose disposal? Tobiah. The room had previously been used for storing the grain offerings, frankincense, various articles of the temple, and ties of grain, new wine, and oil. Now we could take a quick look at the symbolism, all these things. What is grain a picture of? God's Word. Jesus said, you know, He was the bread of life. You know, Jesus in the, in the conversation with uh, the devil in Luke chapter 4 says, we should, you know, when the enemy said, make this, make this stone into bread. And Jesus said, no, we need to live by every word that comes from, from the Lord. So bread is, a, each one of these things, the grain, the new wine, the oil, are a picture of things that are very important symbolically. What is new wine a picture of? The Holy Spirit, olive oil, a picture of like anointing and, and life. And so they had taken these things that were so important to what God was doing, and they took them out, and they got Tobias stuff. You know, if the enemy tries to take God's stuff out of the church, we need to throw that stuff out, right? And that's exactly what, because uh, we, we want the things inside. We want, I want the grain, the new wine, and the oil in this church. Amen? You know, there's nothing more that could be said that would honor what the word of the Lord is doing, what, what the Lord is doing here then somebody like with, uh, we've had friends, uh, Owen Griffin, by the way, Owen and Sybil will be back with us in, uh, uh, in October. And they, one of the things that they said when they first came here a couple years ago is we walked in the door and we sensed the love and the presence of God. We want to make sure that what God wants in this house, what he, what he wants in your house, is what will abide there. That we want the grain. We want the Word of God there. We want the new wine, the Holy Spirit, to abide in your house, in mine, and in this house. And want the, oil, the olive oil, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. But that's what, in the subtle, deceitful way, Tobiah, in his uniting with uh, Eliashib, had taken out. And you know what? Uh, here's what Nehemiah did. When I arrived back in Jerusalem and I learned about this in providing Tobiah with a room in the courtyards of the temple of God, I threw all that stuff out. I became very upset and I threw all of Tobiah's belongings out of that place. Did this seventh attack thwart what God was doing? No. No. You know, so we've looked at just to paraphrase again, and I want to end with one verse and a very encouraging question that the Lord asks you and me today. But we've looked at seven attacks. And God's people, how many did they win out of these seven attacks? Three of them were overt. I'm out to stop you. I, I hate you. I hate what the, the Lord is doing, and I'm out to stop what you're doing. The first three, how many of them stopped God's work? None. We've taken a look at four where he decided, I'm throwing away my black hat. I'm going to try to come together. I'm going to try to make it look like I'm your buddy. And we've taken a look at four. And how many of those succeeded? None. The wall got built. And, you know, if you're a sports team and you go 7-0, and if you're a sports team and you can go 5-2, and that's pretty good, right? You can go 6-1, and that's even better. Rarely to go 7-0. and When we're on God's team, what do we do? We can win every time. And that's what happened. None of these attacks worked against 
what God was doing. I believe in our day, if we follow, if we listen, if we hold close to the Lord, draw me near, Lord Jesus, we will see the same sort of triumph in our day because it's not too big for God. Amen? Amen. I would like to end with one verse and then we're going to turn this into a prayer. Here is, this is the beginning of a prayer that Jeremiah had in Jeremiah chapter 32. And let me just put the context here. That Jeremiah is in prison. He's at the bottom of a stinky, nasty, muddy cistern. You know, they didn't even have air conditioning in this prison facility. It's terrible. And the city is also being, uh, it is under siege. So Jeremiah has a big personal challenge. Is that right? And he also knows that even if he were to get out of prison that day, what challenge is he walking right into? The fact that the city itself is under siege. One of the things that I want to make clear that God is speaking over you and me and over us. No matter what personal challenges that we might face right now, God is bigger and He's able to take care of those for us. And also, God is, His hand is not so short that He cannot save. That He is not thwarted at all to be able to handle the bigger picture, the bigger mess that we're all in. If we're in American believers right now in the United States of America, well, there's a larger challenge. And you know what God says? I'm big enough to take care of your personal situations, and I'm big enough to take care of the mess that's in this country right now. Is that right? That, this, this ought to bring us tremendous encouragement that whatever we're facing personally, God is big enough for that. And He also sees the bigger challenge that we're all in, and He's bigger than that, and He can get us through that. He can triumph in it. You know, and, and I love this, that... Uh, Here's what Jeremiah, here's how he starts this prayer. Ah, Lord God, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power. He's recognizing, if God, if you can make these millions and billions of stars, you can handle my situation. You're big enough to, to help me with the electric bill that I don't have enough money to pay for right now, or whatever the circumstance might be, that my transmission in my car is messing up, and I don't know what I'm going to do about that, that I have a friend who's you know, facing COVID-19 or whatever. God is big enough. And here's the, here's the, here's the, here's what Nehemiah says. You have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and your outstretched arm. And I'm here to say God's outstretched arm is reaching out to you. It's reaching out to me and it's reaching out to us in this nation right now. And here is what, here's what Jeremiah says. There is nothing too hard for you. Now, can we say that together? Lord, there is nothing too hard for you. Now, would you stand? I'd like to turn the next verse into, and the last verse here, into a prayer. This is the beginning of Jeremiah's prayer. This is one of my favorite prayers in the Bible. And it's applicable to us as we are going to see God move in our day, and just like He brought a triumph in moving the nation forward in, in Nehemiah, I believe that as we, I know that as we humble ourselves and seek God's face, we will see it in our day. But there's also something I love. This is the beginning of Jeremiah's prayer in which he says, Lord, there's nothing too difficult for you. You're bigger than my situation, my personal situation. You're bigger than the national situation calamity we're facing right now you can handle them all you can triumph over it all and here's the end of you know jeremiah goes through his whole prayer and then somebody responds to his prayer you know who it was god himself and here's what the lord said then you know jeremiah finishes his prayer in verse 25 now whether there was a pregnant pause before the lord responded or whether it's instantaneous God heard what Jeremiah said. When Jeremiah said, Lord, there's nothing too difficult for you. Here's how the Lord responded. Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. And I believe as we tell the Lord, God, you're bigger than my situation. You're bigger than my challenge. There's nothing to, you're not, you're not too big for the, the circumstances that I'm facing. You're not too big for the mess that this country and the whole world is in. 
the whole COVID-19 situation, everything associated with well, this, you're, this is not too big for you. Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah saying, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. And, you know, the Lord could have, the Lord could have given a statement. He could have said, Jeremiah, you're right. There's nothing too big for me. But I think the Lord did something very, very wise. He asked a question. And he asked Jeremiah this question. Is there anything too hard for me? And he gave in his love and of his desire to see Jeremiah used, he gave Jeremiah the opportunity to say what? Yes. Lord, nothing is too difficult for you. And I want us to respond to that question today too. Every single one of us has challenges that we're facing personally. And that some of them might even seem overwhelming. We might know, I don't have enough money, I don't have enough intelligence, I don't have enough this, I don't have enough that, I don't know how I'm going to get through this. And we can say, Lord, there's nothing too difficult for you. And I know we all can't look at the news. And I, by the way, I don't encourage us. If you're going to find a news source, find a good one <laughs> and listen to this report. But we know that there is a larger context of problems that are a challenge in our nation. And we can say, Lord, there's nothing too good, n nothing too difficult for you. And the Lord, I know the Lord is asking each one of us the question in your personal stuff, and in the challenges we face in the nation, the Lord is asking each one of us, is there anything too hard for me? Can we just take a moment and respond to the Lord about that? Father, we just thank you that you are a powerful God. We acknowledge your goodness. God, we acknowledge that there's, you're not surprised by any of this. And you have an answer for all of it. God, we pray, let your kingdom come, God. Let your will be done. And God, we say in our own personal situations, God, there is nothing too hard for you. In the bigger picture of the COVID situation, which we don't know everything about, the bigger picture of the, of the, just the challenges that our country and our world are facing, God, we say it's not too difficult for you. And God, when you ask, when you come to us out of your love for each one of us and you ask us in our heart, just like you came to Jeremiah and you asked him a question, is there anything too difficult for me? God, we believe that you're asking that question to each one of us individually. And Father, I just want to say, yes, Lord, there is nothing too difficult for you.